Minister Bates, thank you so much for, for joining us on the occasion of uh, Carleton University's second annual uh, Inclusion Week uh, celebrations. Thank you so much and great to meet you. Well, thank you very much for having me. It really is an honor and privilege to be uh, speaking with you. So much has happened in the last year. Uh, we are now what people are calling in the second uh, wave or at least a surge of the pandemic. Uh, there was very difficult and unsettling racial reckoning this summer. These issues seem to be converging in the sense that they, COVID has disproportionate impacts on various uh, portions of the population. And those disproportionate impacts are also being visited economically on, on different parts of the population as well. How has the government's understanding of the role of uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, anti-racism, uh, been influenced by these changing social and economic circumstances? Well, thank you very much, Michael, for raising that issue. Uh, as you heard from the speech from the throne a few days ago, we highlighted the importance of moving forward in a manner to deal with uh, these inequities, to deal with the fact that people have disproportionately been impacted, people of color, uh, people uh, with less income. And so there's a clear understanding that we need to do better. Uh, we as a government have taken some proactive measures to deal with issues around equity and diversity and inclusion through our programming. Uh, the Women Entrepreneurship Program is one such example. Uh, we also came forward with a Black Entrepreneurship Initiative as well. And these tailored-made programs are designed to look at those gaps, the inconsistencies, the challenges that exist right now, and saying we as the government are going to play a role to deal with those issues. Uh, and also empower others in the private sector to step up as well. And uh, we've taken different measures to address those issues. But as you've indicated rightfully uh, in this uh, pandemic, uh, those inequalities have really emerged and come, come to light. And I think there's a clear recognition we need to address those issues head, those issues head on. Um, and it's interesting the, the role that, of course, the university plays in the midst of all of this, this connection between community, uh, private sector, public sector, and so on. How do you see the role of the university changing to meet this challenge and to rise to expectations around uh, changing performance of, around EDI, for example? Well, I think, first of all, there needs to be an understanding that EDI is not only the right thing to do, but it makes, it makes our society better. Uh, if from a business perspective, as a person responsible for the economy, I can tell you right now, when I speak with business leaders, they recognize that EDI gives better outcomes. It drives innovation, productivity, better returns. So not only is it uh, important for us as society, but the economic benefits really create a differentiating factor for us uh, as a country going forward when we compete with other jurisdictions, when we're in this global innovation race uh, for example. But I can tell you right now, uh, universities have a critical role to play in that because they're part of that ecosystem. Uh, and I want to commend Carlton uh, for the work that you're doing really around the inclusion week that you discussed in highlighting faculty members, associations, departments, and students, uh, and promoting that kind of culture. Uh, what we want to do is not just have transactions uh, where you need to do this because you get better outcomes. We want to make this part of our culture. Uh, this should be uh, who we are and how we interact with one another. And EDI should not be something that we think about after the fact, but it should be very much a part of our DNA and part of how we interact with one another. And so I'm excited about the roles that universities can play and particularly Carleton uh, to really highlight the importance of uh, EDI. Wonderful. And uh, the government specifically has enacted, you mentioned some of the sort of policy responses. Uh, I think in particular, um, uh, there is also the federal anti-racism strategy and the enabling uh, action program that look to address issues around employment, social participation and, and justice, uh, particularly for racialized and indigenous folks. Again, uh, how can the university be a partner in that process? Well, there's different aspects to the uh, federal anti-racism strategy. One is we want to show federal leadership. Uh, the prime minister set a very simple example in 20, 
2015 when he talked about diversity at the cabinet table. But we have much more to do. So we need to drive diversity. We need to make sure we look at issues around equity and inclusion as well throughout the federal government. So federal leadership is the first component of that anti-racism strategy. Empowering communities and, and working with their institutions, working with colleges, working with universities, working with a range of organizations and empowering them to make sure that they have the tools uh, to be able to advance this uh, agenda is really important. And I would say the critical component, the third one, uh, is around education and awareness. It's about changing attitudes. It's about making sure that we have impact on people's behavior. Um, and so I think from our perspective, that's the, those are the three key elements of the anti-racism strategy that we put forward. Uh, and again, this is not about government going in alone. This is about building those partnerships, building those coalitions and creating a collective sense of responsibility. And again, Carlton, uh, I've mentioned it before through your inclusion week is one example of that. Excellent. I also um, am interested in your mandate as it relates to um, the uh, collection of disaggregated data and your commitment to renew the long form census for 2021. Talk to us a little bit about uh, what disaggregated data collection means to you. Why is it important? Um, just as background, for example, Car Carlton is now moving decidedly to be uh, much more uh, specific about the kind of data that we collect about our students and our, about our employees. So this is a very pertinent conversation for us right now. And it would be helpful, I think, if, if you share your perspective on why this kind of uh, collection of information is, is critical uh, to inform policy and to, to move us forward. Well, good quality, reliable data leads to good quality, reliable decisions. Uh, you need proper information to understand the situation, uh, to be able to understand the challenges and to be able to make the appropriate uh, decisions as I highlighted. And so for me, uh, reinstating the mandatory long form census in 2015 as a minister responsible for Statistics Canada was truly a point of pride. And now launching uh, the new census is something that's important because we're focusing on, as you said, disaggregated data. And it's really about getting that detailed granular, granular data about the population. And earlier in our conversation, we talked about how COVID-19 has impacted people of color, has impacted people uh, in the low income categories. And so you're only able to determine that through disaggregated data. You need to be able to understand at a very granular level what the population is going through and so you can address some of those issues. And so in the upcoming census, we're looking at ethnicity in greater detail, or we're looking at religion, for example, and these will enable us to understand, better understand how people in different communities have been impacted. And this also highlights the work that we've done through Statistics Canada around the Center for Gender Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, and this is about sharing data, not only collecting data, but sharing data with the broader Canadian population and with other institutions so they can make better uh, decisions as well. Wonderful. Uh, so this ties in quickly uh, and nicely to the next question I have around research. Um, uh, you, you may or may not know Carlton is now celebrating uh, the second year of a significant increase in the attraction of uh, uh, federal uh, research uh, funding. I think a 50% increase, which is the largest increase of any comprehensive or medical university in the country. So a little bit of a shout out for the team there. Um, so in that same light, uh, you know, uh, you are minister for, uh, who promotes uh, science and research, and also we want to encourage uh, greater investment in the humanities and social sciences as well. And you've particularly uh, identified uh, race, uh, research into race and gender as being uh, quite important. How can Carlton align with that, that particular emphasis and, emphasis and take advantage of some of those new directions that the government is going? I think when you look at uh, the research ecosystem, when you look at the research community, it, the, the reality is it lacks the diversity. It lacks the diversity in the individuals receiving the research funds, the individuals allocating the money. And so that is why I built on the legacy and the hard work 
of my former colleague, the Minister of Science, who was responsible for the Dimensions Program, Dr. Kirsty Duncan, uh, and to say, how can we promote better uh, outcomes for diversity in uh, the way we allocate uh, these grants? And so the granting councils that you highlighted have taken on this program, uh, Dimensions, uh, and same with the Canada Research Chairs as well to address these issues. We have had a pilot project, but it's really grown. There's over 110 different institutions, uh, as well as 10 different uh, federal uh, departments that have signed up. And so it's about building momentum. And what we really wanna see is a research ecosystem that's truly diverse. As I said earlier in my remarks, if you want good outcomes for businesses, you need to promote diversity, inclusion, and equity. The same applies to research as well. If you want better research, if you want a better thought leadership, you need diversity as well. And what sort of timetables related to this uh, have you set for yourself? Because yeah, as I understand, the Dimensions program is kind of an, a recognition program, which again, from the perspective of leadership is quite important. What, what, are, what, would, look, what would success look like? And within what time frame are you considering uh, in evaluating uh, these programs? So I'm a very impatient uh, person. I think, uh, you know, talk is important, but action matters. And so I would love to see change within the next three to five years. And I'm talking about meaningful change. Uh, we've got different metrics for different programs, uh, but we're not talking about 10, 15 years. We're talking about the next few years, we need to see sig significant changes of uh, how this money is being deployed and the, the way we're creating diversity in our ecosystem. And, and so for me, if we don't see the desired outcomes, uh, then we're gonna reevaluate our programming uh, and we're gonna be more aggressive with universities uh, and with other institutions as well, including the federal government. I think this is really important to note. This is not simply about university stepping up, but we also need to play a leadership role and look in the mirror as well when it comes to the federal government. Thank you, that's great. So with just the, the short time remaining, I want us to look to the future now and think about not only undergraduate students perhaps uh, who, are, who are currently enrolled, but also those uh, students who are in high school now and who are uh, for you know the first time in their lives having to deal with remote learning and virtual learning and uh, who have a fair amount of uncertainty as to uh, given you know their youth and the limited amount of time they've had on this planet to see the ups and the downs, but who are quite, you know, concerned about what the future holds. What do you say to them in terms of what the future holds and how does our focus on EDI uh, look to sort of improve those futures? Look, we live in the best country in the world, in my humble opinion. Uh, it's not a perfect country, but it's the best country. And we have a lot of work to do to a deal with these uh, inequities that exist that we've discussed throughout the last few minutes. Uh, but I also would say we live in the best time in human history uh, where we have so much hope, uh, so many opportunities and the role that technology can play. And so young people should feel optimistic and be creative and look at how we can tackle these issues because they're empowered to do so. Uh, I've got two young girls and trust me, I want them to feel very, very hopeful that it's not simply about earning money, which is important. It's not about generating wealth, which is important, but it's about solving problems. It's about having impact. It's about following your passion. And so my message is, look, uh, things are daunting. Things are challenging right now. Uh, but if you look at it in the, in the broader context, we couldn't live in a better place. Uh, and we have just so much, uh, so many possibilities. And so uh, my mindset is, and this is something that my grandfather taught me, who left uh, Pakistan in 1947 during partition and moved to uh, India and started from scratch and then left India to come to Canada and started from scratch. And he said to me, look, uh, you got to recognize that this is life. You're going to have to start from scratch. You're going to have to hustle. Uh, but you got to have the right mindset and the right attitude. And I've seen him succeed multiple times. I've tried to emulate that in my life. And that would be my message to, to young people is that you're not the only one. People have always gone through struggle, but you're in a unique position to have impact and we're here to support you. Well, that is wonderful. I'm sure it will be well received by our undergraduates as well as our, our graduate students. Um, I'll just end by saying uh, thank you so much, Minister, for joining us and, and sharing some of your reflections. 
Uh, I think it would be a great bomb to people as we uh, move and struggle through these transitional, transformational periods. Um, and I'll also say I'm a little bit jealous you got better lighting than I did, I, I have to say. But anyway, <laughs> next time, next time. Uh, thank you, Mike. Us again. Uh, no, thank you for this opportunity. Keep up the great work. I'm so proud of your leadership and what Carlton has done. And like I said, it truly is a privilege and honor to have this opportunity to speak with you and, and convey this message to the broader Carlton community. And I look forward to working with you. Will do. Much appreciated. And we'll be in touch. For sure.